Professor Doug Shadle. I teach in the Blair School of Music. Uh, I'm in the musicology department, and musicology is just a fancy word for the history of music, and so I like to think of myself as a historian uh, who looks at musical phenomena. And so I teach classes in music history, both to music majors and uh, non-music majors or music minors, and we cover a lot of different uh, topics in my classes. I focus mostly on music in the 19th century, so um, you might think of Thomas Jefferson to the Gilded Age, something like that. And my own specialty, as we'll learn today, is in the United States. And so uh, that's where I'm coming from, and that's what we're going to hear about. Now, thank you all for coming. Uh, the advertising for these talks didn't tell you that this is going to be the fun lecture. So you picked the right one. <laughs> and just to give you a little taste, just check this out. This is how fun we're going to be. <laughs> distant past. 
American orchestras have virtually always resisted new things in favor of old. So looking at the contemporary landscape, as these explanations do, can only take us so far in seeing a very narrow picture. From my vantage point, cultural patterns are easier to replicate and repeat than to disrupt, and so they persist. It's sort of like wearing funny gowns at commencement. We do it because we've always done it. <laughs> Now the patterns I'm talking about today started to take a firm hold in the middle of the 19th century. At that time, the standard repertoire of symphony orchestras began to take shape. Now how many of you have heard of Ludwig von Beethoven? Everyone. What about Mozart? Everybody. What about Felix Mendelssohn? Everyone has heard of these names. Now how many of you aside from the students who have taken my class, <laughs> have heard of George Frederick Bristow. What about William Henry Fry? No one. But you aren't alone. I was a violist in collegiate and professional orchestras for about 10 years and never played any of their music, or any American who lived primarily in the 19th century. I played pieces by Aaron Copeland and Leonard Bernstein, some Americans who were a bit closer to our time, and a few others, but no one who was really, really old, no one who was from the time of Beethoven, Mendelssohn, and so on. Now, let me state my central position for today's talk so that it's clear. Beethoven, Mozart, and Mendelssohn, all German-speaking composers, became canonical figures in the performance repertoire of American orchestras during the mid-19th century. And this situation, as your answers have shown today, have shown, has never changed, despite some serious efforts to change it. But as we'll see, disruptors like this Bristow and Fry characters did not have much luck with symphony orchestras in their own day, even the orchestras in their own neighborhood. And their problem was curious indeed. They were too American. Now, why was being an American composer in the 19th century such a problem? <clears throat> On the surface, it doesn't make any sense. We should support American composers in America. Well, let's start with the New York Philharmonic, the country's oldest permanent orchestra. It was founded in 1842, which is the same year, incidentally, as the Vienna Philharmonic. So Vienna can't claim an older orchestra, a major orchestra, over New York City. Well, in 1879, about 40 years after the orchestra was founded, the biggest musical magazine in the country interviewed one of the original founders of the orchestra, a man named Harvey Dodworth. Now the reporter asked Dodworth what he thought about the status of the Philharmonic in 1879. And he said, the purpose of the New York Philharmonic Society was a lofty one. It was intended for the encouragement of art. One especial object which we had in view was the founding, if possible, of an American school of composition. And it was required that at least one American work should be performed during each season. Now think about this for a second. The New York Philharmonic was founded to promote American composition. That was one of its original purposes. Now anyone who knows anything about the Philharmonic today can tell you that it is failing miserably at this mission. Well, what happened? Dodworth goes on to tell us. At the start, in 1842, the Philharmonic was the most cosmopolitan thing you ever saw. There were in it Italians, French, English, Germans, and Americans. Not one-fourth of them were Germans. Now, it is an exclusively German organization. Well, his implication was that German musicians stamped out American com composers which in turn led to what we might call mission creep today, and if you go into the nonprofit sector, uh, know what this is. The Philharmonic just stopped caring about its original mission and moved on to something else. So right there in this interview seemed to be the answer to our question, how it was that orchestras developed this German inertia and why you know so much about German music and nothing else. But was Dodworth right? Who were these composers that German musicians supposedly boxed out of the Philharmonic's program? That's what we're going to learn about. So let's start with George Frederick Bristow. In my opinion, Bristow was the greatest American composer of the 19th century. 
His father was a theater musician, which at the time was about the only full-time equivalent for performing musicians. You could really make a good living in the theaters because there were shows every night uh, and they all had these small orchestras. Now George started playing violin in theaters alongside his father by the time he was 13. So it's a very young man who was initiated into this world. Now George's father was also a charter member of the New York Philharmonic. And George joined him in the 1843 season. And this is where things start to get pretty funny. Looking back on this period of his life as an older man, Bristow recalled that he loved to play pranks on his fellow musicians. And anyone who's been in a touring choir or something can probably attest that this still goes on. So in one episode, he dumped lamb oil into the community snuff box and accidentally poisoned his father with it. Now in another, <laughs> even better, he stuffed a fish inside the bell of a French horn and somehow ended up laying the blame on an unsuspecting flute player. And these two came to blows over this uh, fish and the French horn. <laughs> so that tells you a little bit about Bristow as a person. He was a, a nice prankster. And he was also an aspiring composer from a fairly early age. As Harvey Dodworth mentioned, the Philharmonic's original constitution included a passage saying that it would perform at least one American work every season, provided it had one to play. Now this may not sound like much, but orchestra seasons back then were only three or four concerts. So putting one American piece on this limited space really was significant. I mean, today one piece sounds really insignificant because it's a full, a full year season. But back then, there was only a small space, and so having one piece would have made a huge difference. Now, the first time the Philharmonic acted on the Constitution was in 1847. This is five years after its founding, when it premiered a concert overture by Bristow. Now, critics thought this piece was OK. I mean, here's Bristow. He's, what, 22? Uh, that's my math right now. He's about 22 years old. Critics thought it was OK, but that he could improve. And that's about what anyone would expect. Now, Bristow, meanwhile, took their words to heart and began composing his first symphony. So he does, he does this right away. Well, this is when problems really <coughs> started to happen. The next year, 1848, revolutions started sweeping the European continent, especially the German-speaking lands. Now, these revolutions were mainly unsuccessful and left a lot of refugees and migrants. So we might think of you know, the Civil War and turmoil today leading to these massive movements of people. Simil somewhat similar to what was going on throughout Western and Central Europe during the time. Now, many of these migrants just got on ships, sort of left their lives behind, and came to the United States. But there were, of course, many musicians among them. Germans like to think of themselves as the musical people. And so a lot of them brought musical instruments over and set up shop here. Well, with this great flow of immigrants to New York City, the Philharmonic roster really swelled with German musicians, who were the best players. But this, as it turns out, was pretty bad news for Bristow and any other American composers. At this time, it's not like this today, but back then, the Philharmonic was run as a democracy. All of the players could vote on programming, personnel, and so forth. So once there was a German-speaking majority, as we all know from current election, all you need is the 51%, it was easy to skirt old rules, which is precisely what happened. By 1850, so just a year or so after these revolutions, the orchestra had still not performed Bristow's first symphony, which had been done for quite a while, or any other American music for that matter. Patriotic critics grumbled loudly in the press, and the orchestra finally gave in to the pressure and programmed the music at a public rehearsal at the end of the season, so they sort of tacked it on at the end uh, to, to reconcile. Now musically, this first symphony is a mixed bag. It's clear to me that Bristow modeled the piece on a symphony by Mozart, which is not a bad choice, obviously. But while we might think looking to great composers for inspiration was a good idea, critics, even the same critics who wanted to hear the piece, who agitated the Philharmonic to perform it, claimed that Bristow was too derivative. So he really couldn't win. One of them said that it was like a musical chessboard with a field for each composer from the time of Haydn to Mendelssohn. So already we can see the kind of bind that American composers were in by 1850. On the one hand, the city's most prominent orchestra didn't want to perform their music, despite rules 
saying that it should. But on the other hand, critics were only willing to judge symphonies by the standard of Haydn, Mendelssohn, and Beethoven. They seemed unwilling to accept that an American composer might legitimately continue the symphonic tradition. And this is funny to me, I mean, not funny funny, but serious funny. The critics weren't complaining that someone like Mendelssohn, who had just died, he died in 1847, and his music was just uh, becoming known in the United States, they weren't complaining that he sounded too much like Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, or Weber. But they complained that Bristow sounded like too much, or sounded too much like these other composers. So there was, you know, a, a double standard going on. Well, now let's listen to some music. Okay, this is where the fun starts to begin. Bristow's first symphony, this piece, has never been recorded, which tells you something about how little we know about the music. But fortunately for us, the second, third, and fourth symphonies that Bristow wrote have been recorded. Ironically, a couple of them by British orchestras. <laughs> and uh, Bristow incidentally wrote a total of five symphonies, uh, of which only the three are recorded. Now, to my ears, the, cri the critics uh, were right about the music. It does sound a lot like other composers from the time, but I don't think we should expect anything uh, otherwise. So let's play a game for a second. Okay, even my students, I think, can, can uh, work with this game. Can you tell which composer is Bristow and which is someone else? No problem. Okay. So everyone, I don't know, just close your eyes for a second. Just relax here. I'm going to play uh, two excerpts of symphonic pieces. Uh, each of these two excerpts is from a slow movement in a symphony. So it's from the same kind of moment in the symphony that we would expect. So here's example number one. this correctly. Which one is Bristow? Which one is someone else? Okay, it's not as easy as it seems. Now, here's another comparison. Uh, one of these examples is from Bristow's third symphony. One is from a major famous composer's symphony. And it's from a fast movement. It's sort of a, an interior movement in the symphony that's traditionally uh, scored to be light and kind of fun. So here's example number one, the, the light music. Thank you. 
I, am I wrong here? Do these sound similar to you, just on the surface and with no prompting? It's very similar, very similar. Now here's our last example. This is quite a bit later in Bristow's career. It's from the 1870s, and it's another piece that was written in the 1870s by a, a famous composer. This, I, I can't remember what movements these are from. I think it could be the first movement, maybe the second, but it's a bit more serious, uh, heavy music than what we've heard so far.
But it's worth pointing out that the reference to Hessians would have been a harsh insult at the time, very harsh. As you may know, the British Army had hired Hessian mercenaries during the Revolutionary War, and they were widely considered enemies of liberty. And so to re-invoke this uh, Hessian encroachment was, was pretty harsh. But Bristow wasn't quite done yet. If all their artistic affections are unalterably German, let them pack back to Germany and enjoy the police and bayonets and aristocratic kicks and cuffs of that land where an artist is a serf to a nobleman, as the history of all of their great composers shows. America has made the political revolution which illumines the world, while Germany is still be shrouded with a feudal darkness. While America has been thus far able to do the chief things for the dignity of man, forsooth, he's waving a finger, I think, she must be denied the brains for original art and must stand like a beggar, deferentially cap in hand when she comes to compete with the ability of any dirty German village. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> now, it should come as no surprise that these remarks came in the midst of a rising anti-immigrant sentiment nationwide and the rise of the Know Nothing Party. I mean, this was sort of part and parcel of the political discourse at the time. But in this case, I can really understand Bristow's frustration. I mean, it's not this sort of, excuse my South Park reference, but it's not the, you know, they took our jobs. It's not that sort of thing. It's, I mean, there is a real disconnect here between what the Philharmonic is doing and what the American composers are trying to accomplish. Because by 1854, when this was happening, he had been a member of the Philharmonic for over 10 years. Oh, and I forgot to mention, he was also the concertmaster of the orchestra, and they still rejected his music. But the new German majority threw up roadblocks to his compositional success <laughs> at every turn. They formed ranks around their own music. Now, there's a lot to the story that we can never know that's kind of behind the scenes, but I imagine it wasn't very pretty. Well, I've spent quite a bit of time on Bristow, but that's because he left such a colorful and interesting record of his engagement with the Philharmonic, and he outlined some of the core issues we're exploring here. Now, it strikes me as particularly unjust that the orchestra's concertmaster could face such difficulty over his ethnicity when the music, as we all just heard, is virtually indistinguishable from the vast majority of other works in the Philharmonic program. But our next composer, though, this Mr. Fry, is a completely different story. Unlike Bristow, William Henry Fry's main profession wasn't exactly musical. He was born in Philadelphia in 1813, and his father was a newspaper printer. With that handy professional connection, he became a music critic at a relatively young age and moved up the ranks in Philadelphia's journalism scene. And I just can't emphasize enough how useful it is to be a composer and a critic, right? <laughs> That's your own. You have a ready-made platform. Well, at the same time that he was uh, earning his way up in, in the uh, journalism scene, he was also writing operas. He was an aspiring opera composer. And in 1845, he produced the first English language opera in the Italian bel canto style of Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini. And for that, you might think of the uh, mid 20th century soprano Maria Callas here. And this is actually the music that she was most famous for singing. Well, in 1846, he did uh, what a lot of Americans, uh, a lot of American musicians did. He traveled to Paris for two professional reasons. First was to try to have his opera performed there, which didn't happen, no surprise, and to report on European affairs to the American public. And what's kind of cool about this is that he was reporting on these revolutions that were going on in Western Europe, as Bristow is sort of still in New York City over here in this, the kind of confluence of events. It's just, it's just neat to think about that it's happening at the exact same time. Well, he ended up spending six years in Paris as a correspondent to a Philadelphia newspaper, as well as magazines and newspapers in New York, including Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Well, when he came back to the United States in 1852, he moved to New York City and joined the staff of the Tribune, a position he would hold until his death in 1864. And interesting side note here, I just sort of thought of this, since we're in a presidential election year, he stumped for Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party during the 1860 election and actually wrote this big 100-page anti-slavery treatise that he then sent to Lincoln to say, you know, I'm doing all of these good works for you, blah, 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 blah. You can see this in the Lincoln papers in the Library of Congress. 
And then a couple of years after Lincoln became president, he appointed Fry to be a uh, kind of a foreign delegate to Italy, which was a new country at the time in the 1860s. But Fry got sick. You see, he died in 1864, but he got really sick and couldn't make the trip. But it's just kind of cool to think about this composer doing all this political work and then reaping the rewards through the political system. You know, I, I don't know what composers today, well, goodness knows who will be president you know, in a few months, but uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, what composer today would kind of work their way into the system, but he was certainly uh, had his fingers in a lot of different uh, pies. Well, when Fry came back from Paris, kind of back to our story here, he was really fired up about the status of American composers because he learned the hard way that they were held in very low esteem in Europe. So you can only imagine his disgust when he learned about how the Philharmonic had been treating Bristow this whole time. He was so disgusted, in fact, that he led a series of lectures on the history of music that ended with a forceful plea for Americans to support local composers. The American public are too fond of quoting Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, and European artists generally, and decrying whatever is not modeled after their rules. And composers, he said, shouldn't allow the name of Beethoven or Handel or Mozart to prove an eternal bugbear to him. Instead, composers should strike out manfully and independently into untrodden realms, just as his nature and inspirations may incite him, else he can never achieve lasting renown. And here he's channeling Ralph Waldo Emerson. Well, this is precisely what Fry did with his own music. Fry was a big believer in the concept that we now call program music that instrumental music should paint pictures or even tell a story. And all of his symphonies do this. And you can tell just from their titles. A Day in the Country, The Breaking Heart, The Dying Soldier, Child Harold, Niagara, Hagar in the Wilderness, and Santa Claus. Yes, Santa Claus. Fry's Santa Claus, which he called a Christmas symphony, is his magnum opus. And it really is a great piece of music, in my opinion. It's just that nobody plays it. It's about 25 minutes long, and it tells this elaborate story about Christmas. And it's like a family is uh, they're sort of celebrating Christmas Eve. They have a big dinner, and there's a dance. And then the children go to bed, and they say their prayers. And then there's a winter storm. And at the stroke of midnight, we hear Santa Claus coming on the scene. And then he distributes some toys, and yada, yada, yada. It kind of goes on. And so it's this really elaborate story that he paints in uh, musical tones. And all of this information is contained in a 1,300-word essay printed for programs at the, at the New York premiere in 1853. So audiences had a little booklet. Now what makes the piece especially noteworthy, though, is that Fry conceived it more or less as an instrumental opera. Remember, he was an opera composer. So at the beginning, for instance, uh, you can hear an Italianate cornet solo which is meant to depict an angel announcing the impending birth of Jesus. And that's this uh, sound here. at the end, it's the, the orchestra direction is to follow the cornet player as if the cornet is just taking a little bit of liberty there, just like an opera singer would just follow the voice is what it says. Now this overall soundscape is what I meant earlier when I mentioned bel canto composition. So this moment sounds a lot like Fry's <coughs> uh, operas. The melody has a nice art shape, the harmonies are a bit juicy, and the cornet, as I just mentioned, plays a little bit with the rhythm. Now in addition to this sound, the symphony also has this neat technique, which is called instrumental restative. Now, restative in an opera is how the characters talk to one another. They sing arias, which is like this, but then they also need to talk to each other like in a play. Uh, there's dialogue. Well, Fry translated that into an instrumental environment. And in this case, he depicts a family praying the Lord's Prayer 
in the traditional English translation, in the evening before bed. And here, you don't need to, you don't need to be able to read music to follow this, but I've got the words underneath, and I can kind of speak it as we listen. But it's, it's cool here how he does this. But the real tour de force here is the arrival of Santa Claus, just after the stroke of midnight. Here we go. Here he is in the bassoon. This moment is when Beethoven meets Santa Claus, the title of my talk. If any of you know Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is famous for the Ode to Joy theme, it ends with a glorious statement of that tune, but the first statement of the tune is very soft in the cellos, I think in the basses. So fun. Well, here, Fry has transplanted a tune that everyone would have known in his original audience in the same kind of dramatic context. And just like in the Ninth Symphony, as we heard at the beginning of my talk, we get the same return of the full orchestra. And I think for the sake of time, I won't play it again. I think you all remember. But what makes this moment especially cool is that there is no choral part written into the score like there is in Beethoven's Symphony. There's a chorus that sings. But there is a choral part, nevertheless. So who do you think sings it? There's no chorus on stage. Exactly, the audience. And I haven't read accounts that said it happens, but it's pretty clear in Fry's writings about the piece that that was supposed to happen. He calls it the choral finale, even though there's no chorus. So it's, you know, who else is, is doing it? So you can imagine 3,000 people in a concert hall joining in at the close of the piece. It strikes me as an especially democratic sort of gesture, something that Beethoven's music, I think, he wanted to capture, but it doesn't because there's not this participatory. 
exploratory moment. Well, there's much more I could say about Fry and his Wild Niagara Symphony, for instance, but we need to move on for the sake of time. In 1853, just a few months, oh, I forgot to show you Beethoven. There it is. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, that's what it's Beethoven being Santa Claus here. <laughs> He's not very impressed. <laughs> well, in 1853, just a few months after Fry came to New York from Paris, Another American who had been living in Paris came back to the United States, and this was the pianist and composer Louis Moreau Gottschalk, as you can see his you know, fabulous fingers here. Today, Gottschalk is probably the most famous of the three composers I'm sharing with you. His music is still heard on recitals and that sort of thing. Now, he was born in Louisiana and grew up in the rich multicultural environment of New Orleans. As a teenager, he traveled to Paris where he studied privately and led a successful series of concert debuts. And of course, as I mentioned with Fry, this is kind of what the, the tradition was. If you could make it in Europe, you could then come back to the US, even if you started here. You had to get it there first. Well, with this success in hand, he went back to the United States, where he was similarly successful, but really as a pianist, as an orchestral music composer, not so much. But unlike Fry and Bristow, Gottschalk also traveled to the Caribbean and South America, where he wrote some really interesting music. When he was living in Paris, Gottschalk wrote a lot of short piano pieces that incorporated the sounds from the Creole music he knew from his childhood. So as he traveled through the Caribbean and South America in the 1850s, he continued this strategy by mixing traditional classical styles with local color. And the best example of this comes from his symphony called A Night in the Tropics, which he wrote for a gigantic music festival in Havana, Cuba uh, in 1859-1860. Now, in the second movement, we can hear just how he incorporated this color. Find it today. 
Well, as I've also hoped to show, there was a lot of stylistic variety among composers living in the same place at exactly the same time. They were the disruptors, the Americans who had a chance to dislodge the German musical canon. But each one faced individual barriers that ultimately led to their exclusion from certain areas of the city's musical life. And Bristow, I'll just say this again, strikes me as especially unjust since he himself was a leader among orchestral musicians. But the Philharmonic's German contingent couldn't get past their national pride. And so the institutional inertia, regardless of its unsavory source, remains with us today. Well, as a takeaway then for our graduates and others, or perhaps a call to action, I'd encourage you to think about the fact that there never really is a test of time that great music passes and poor music fails. There is only ever an institutional structure. And this message is especially important for new college graduates who will soon be entering new institutions, businesses, nonprofits, government agencies, graduate schools, and so on. Ideas theoretically exist somewhere out there in a free marketplace, but they only ever become concrete as failures or successes within institutional or organizational structures with various moving parts. And what makes life difficult sometimes is that these moving parts don't always work harmoniously together. Just think of Bristow the Concertmaster, or your latest trip to the DMV, for that matter. These parts don't always work together. Now finally, I hope that my talk today has shown you that the sentence, this is the way we've always done it, is the absolute worst reason for doing something, because you never know what the original reason might have been. So if you ever hear those words, speak up, challenge them, and honor the forgotten legacy of everyone whose good ideas were crushed by institutions. The world will be a better place. I do have a good bit of time for questions, if you have any. Yes. Sorry, Me first? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, a couple of things. First of all, thank you. Great talk. Sure. So, are you going to ask us who, which ones we oh, have Bristow wrote? Oh, if you were taking, I should have had, I had well, to do a notepad. Well, I'm going to take a guess, sure. unless you want to have us vote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what do we want to do? Does anyone have strong feelings, or can she, can she give the answers? What do we think? I might get it wrong, but That's I'm going to go, go out on the list. So I want to say, if my memory's right, that of the first two, the first one was Bristow. Okay. And then the, the example three and four, that was a Mendelssohn and then Bristow. Wasn't that meant? Yes, yes. Okay, so it is. So yeah. like you did three pairs, right? Mm -hmm. You did? Yeah. So I was thinking, if, I, if my memory's right, Bristow and then someone else, and then Mendelssohn and Bristow, and then someone else in Bristow. Okay. Am I really wrong? Yeah, yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, so, so, what, so you, your second pair is correct. So this is, it was, so um, the Scherzo to Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream was number one. And that's a pretty famous piece. And so this is what makes it hard to do this sometimes, because Mendelssohn, uh, his music is very well known among orchestral music lovers. Yeah, so it was Mendelssohn and Bristow. But the, uh, the first one was Mendelssohn, his third symphony, and then Bristow's second symphony. Wow. And the scoring is almost the exact same. I think that Bristow was actually looking at Mendelssohn's score to kind of revise a little bit of the uh, orchestration, because the Philharmonic had just played the Mendelssohn piece, and so it would have had it handy. And then the third pairing is this um, somewhat lesser known composer today named Joachim Roth, but who was really famous in the 1870s, both in Europe and the United States. He was, um, he died young, like a lot of these composers, for whatever reason. Uh, but he died young in the 1880s, and so uh, it was sort of hard for his legacy to continue past uh, his lifetime. Uh, but the Mendelssohn piece, uh, sorry, sorry, the uh, Bristow piece and the Roth uh, have a very similar architectural design uh, and scoring as well. And so, you know, I think the argument that one piece deserved to be performed again and again and again and again, and the other just sort of boxed out makes no sense. I mean, your, your answer is just I prove, think, the point. prove it, prove the point. And the yeah. first pairing, who, who was the first pairing? Uh, Mendelssohn also. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. yeah so Mendelssohn have first. you ever put on a concert here or gone to one where they don't list the composers? 
No, but I would love for that to, be, that be, a cool to be the norm. Thing? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> funny. Uh, Gottschalk, there, there was this, <laughs> you've got to buy the book. It's, 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 there's this critic. <laughs> I just hate this critic. His name is John Sullivan Dwight. And he was just the, the absolute, um, oh, have you taken the, this is Leventheimer's American Music Class where he goes on, or, or just my class, oh, okay. So I, I really hate this guy. Um, but he, he, was, he didn't read music, but he was just a very loud music. And uh, Gottschalk one time put Beethoven's name on one of his own pieces, and the piece sounds nothing like they, I mean, it's just sort of, I don't know, kind of southern sounding music. Um, and then he put Gottschalk's name on the Beethoven piece. And Dwight, in his review the next day, says, oh, this piece by Beethoven was so amazing, even though Gottschalk had actually written it. And he pans the, the actual Beethoven piece because Gottschalk's name was on it. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, the, the people, it, it really is an, an ideology, yeah. and it's a way of thinking that, I mean, it's, it doesn't completely ignore the music. Because it's not like, I mean, there, there are certain composers who, whose music, um, you know, I'm kind of, frankly, I'm kind of glad that it's gone. I mean, it's just sort of like, you can sort of see why over time it wouldn't have persisted. But then there are other pieces that is, it's much harder to explain. And so, you know, it's, a, it's partly based in the music itself, but then it's the larger part, I think, is ideology and mindset. Why are like modern American composers? It appears their pieces, you know, rarely get a second or third hearing. You know, like I, I played in an orchestra where where they've done it across the country. You know, made in America, Schwantner and other people, sure. and then like the pieces never get it. You never hear of them again. Yeah, right. Yeah. So this this is a really interesting question. So this whole idea that if you play the piece once, then you've done your duty <laughs> as a new music supporter, but then if you never play it again, you know, so what? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way it's been since this time. So Bristo symphonies were performed, uh, in some cases, just the one time. In other cases, he had a sort of a champion conductor who performed his pieces over and over again. So that's the ultimate goal. And then if that person dies or something, then, then you're out of luck. Um, well, I really think it's, it, it's, there's a sociological explanation for it. That a conductor or a soloist gets all the glory for saying, I support new music bios of conductors and solo performers, and they all say how much they support new music. But very few of them actually stake their entire careers only on new music. Their bread and butter is the core repertoire, but then they can also say they're champions of new music by doing a piece once. And so it's like, they, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor, but it's like, you know, so it, it trends for a moment. They get all the glory for it. And then once they're done with it, there's nothing for the performer to gain from continuing to support these pieces. It's sort of like it, there's a real power imbalance between the players and the composers. Where the players have a lot of power, the composers have very little. They rely on the players. So it's sociological in that there's not a lot of reward for performing new music again and again and again, only the once, and then it's gone. But, but, but isn't the second part, though, the, the organizations that are afraid to, because they won't get an audience for them? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, yes. It, it, in that, oh, sorry, that, that, that liberality or innovativeness can only get you so far that there's this concern that if you go too far, then you're going to lose you know, in the other direction. But I think, you know, if, if no one ever takes the chance, then it's hard to find real empirical data about the, the sort of truthiness of that, <laughs> that argument. I mean, it, 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 take the New York Philharmonic, for instance, the current director, Alan Gilbert, has just done so much creative programming with new music and sort of recent music and audiences just love it. I mean, it's like really out in the community doing things. Well, when they just recently announced a new director, uh, Jotlin Schaden, who's currently directing in Dallas, all anyone could talk about was how this guy is really great with the War Horse pieces and the canonical repertoire, but hasn't been much of a new music uh, conductor. And their thinking is they, they have started to become accustomed to this new regime under Alan Gilbert how positive it's actually been that now the, the sort of the, the new music side of the equation is very afraid of what will happen next. And so it's like we get a taste of it, but then you know forces change and things change. So it's kind of like like this. But you know I think I think what I'm showing here too, just to bring it back to the talk, is that um, you know it's been this sort of wave pattern for over 150 years. I mean 
there are always attempts to push us in new directions, but then for reasons that sometimes defy all logic, we don't go there. Oh, sure, and like, who, who wields all the power behind the scenes? Yeah, well, it was, it was certainly that way back then, too. I mean, it was um, in this time, the 1870s, when uh, they had to make a rule adjustment in the bylaws even to allow a non-musician to be the executive uh, director of the, the board of directors. And um, there was sort of a big power shift there where now purely musical interests changed to more public slash private interests, and it, it was no longer about the musicians at this point, it was sort of you know, this other thing, and that was in the 1870s, right, as Bristow was uh, getting on his, getting a second win there. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of institutional history and uh, background going on. Yeah, uh, I, I was curious because you mentioned that uh, Bristow had this uh, critical evidence to show how, how uh, the critics responded to um, his music as, and essentially comparing him in the light of like this great like German, you know, German aura or, or critical standard, uh, un, and you call that unfair. But uh, how does that apply, or do we even have any data on how that applied to critical receptions of um, the the other two composers we looked at, Fry and, and, and Gottschalk, uh, because they did program music, and so it seems like to compare them, you, what do you compare them to? They're by definition doing something that's like very unique, and so it seems like that's. What was the, the deal there, I guess? Well, see, that makes them, that's a great question. I mean, this, this whole idea of if they're doing something that's totally on the different the other side of the stylistic spectrum, it, it's really easy to dismiss them as just far outside the mainstream. And that's what the critics said. I mean, Fry gets this big argument at the same time that the Philharmonic sort of kerfuffle is going on. Fry is waging his own war about why his music, his program music in Santa Claus is worthwhile and why he chose not to write in the German symphonic tradition. But of course, I mean, the German symphonic tradition is really hard to fight against uh, intellectually because it, it's so so august. Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven. I mean, it's it's hard to to say I'm doing something completely different. Come listen to me uh, when everybody is sort of on the other side. And so uh, it, it was an easy way to dismiss his music. And then in later generations, it's kind of funny. There are some quotations um, from an 1876 performance at the American Centennial. Uh, some of Fry's music, and he'd been dead for about uh, 12 years. And they say, you know, Fry was writing at a time when people had lofty ideals, but they were basically children and still finding their way. But then this other composer, who is, his name is John Knowles Payne, writes very Germanic style. This is when Americans really found themselves when they could finally enter into the German tradition. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know. Well, it's just crazy because, like, and then, like, the German tradition is also seen as eventually encapsulating Wagner. Who like yeah. you? That's that's very programmatic. You know what I'm saying? Like there's not nothing about it other than its Germanness seems to be like actually a stylistic marker. I, it's, I don't know. It gets German. It's the Germans and the musical people thing. It's just this idea that's like captured. I don't know. It just seems very strange. Yeah. No. It, 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 you're just exactly right. You're just on so uh, uh, hitting hitting you know on all cylinders at this point. So it, at first it's kind of Germans against Americans, but then as there's more stylistic differentiation among German music, it's like there becomes this weird prismatic thing going on. And, and everyone takes all sides of the, uh, the argument. So, you know, after the Civil War, it just, everything explodes. And that's the second half of the book. <laughs> Is it time? Is it that time? 4.15? Or? Yeah, I was going to say, if you want to step out, you know, feel free. Um, if you want to stay, I'm happy to stay for a few more minutes. So, um, we'll, do a com we'll do a comma. <laughs> theater, uh, that's like a whole other book and lecture, but has there been a similar parallel of um, resistance to innovation? Or, I'm thinking, I, I mean, I haven't seen Hamilton yet, but it's doing well. Yeah, yeah. I can't see it because it's too expensive. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not really my wheelhouse, but I mean, yeah. I, I'm just blown away by, by its success. I mean, I think it's well deserved. Um, right. And, and in fact, it's bucks this trend of doing the same old thing. Right. Um, and so, oh, you're welcome. So I think there is, there are possibilities out there if we allow them right. to happen, you know. Uh, 
um, I think having, again, it's about navigating the institutions. Having media on your side, certain backers, um, you know, behind the scenes. Right. I mean, it, it really helps. It's, it's working that whole structure where if, you know, part of the, the, the machinery is not on your side, then I mean, you just won't have the success. So part of it is about the product itself. Right. Part of it is the machinery. Oh, sure. You know, the marketing it. is, it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, again, the musical is fantastic. I, I heard it, I haven't seen yeah, it, but, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and people love it, And uh, but then there's still, there are some other aspects of it that I think help explain right. um, the buzz. So um, really in about the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, sort of the early 20th century, uh, there was a great desire for a specifically American sound. And this coincided with this drive for new and modern sounds, of course, which takes hold in France and Germany and elsewhere kind of modernism. And the, the coalescence of innovative Americanness and innovative modernism really worked in their favor, especially Copeland. But then in the case of uh, like Bernstein, he was a conductor and a composer. So again, very again, he's working the institutional structures to his own benefit. And uh, one thing I highlight in the book, in, in the epilogue, when I talk about Copeland and Bernstein, is that they give public lectures during this period, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. And they demean 19th century composers to say, Sort of similar things that this 1876 critic said that it's sort of like the kindergarten period of American music, and so it's like they they come up with ways to boost their own profile while saying, "Look at how we're doing. What we're doing is so different from the past." Yeah, and so it's again, it's like it's the product and the ideas on the one hand, but then working the institutions in their favor on the other. So as far as like modern. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a whole other set of institutions where they, they're they working in more of a mass media environment, they get kind of a different sort of level of exposure. Um, and I mean, what's what's neat about them is that they, in a sense, a lot of their music has crossed over into uh, classical performance as well, um, partly because it's popular. I mean, like, you, you can't not <laughs> do it. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like working in a different area of culture. In terms of modern composers, do you have any uh, composers that you have you know, respect for or you, or you really like their work? And also, do you see any of modern composers' work becoming part of the standard repertoire some, you know, for future generations, or do you see it just kind of doing what's, what it's doing? No, I don't know. I, I, I should play the horses if I could really get this right. But, uh, <laughs> I know that's a tough question. Yeah, I mean, someone like John Adams, the minimalist composer, has already, I think, established more or less permanence. Um, he's still writing, but then his older pieces are, are now more or less canonical, and you hear them uh, frequently in orchestra concerts. Um, the composer Mason Bates, who's done some work with the Chicago Symphony, yeah. I think now is in Kennedy Center, has done a lot of multimedia stuff. Um, I, I think it has a, a lot of potential to stick uh, in the future, kind of in the public imagination, with new media like YouTube and this sort of thing, you know, newer media. Um, but. The work is so tied to the person himself that it may not last as part of a performance tradition into the future. And so, um, you know, the music is, I think, fantastic on a number of levels, but it's you know, very idiosyncratic in a sense. Um, and so, as part of the recorded legacy of our present time, I think that it's got potential. Um, there are also uh, some. Um, East Asian composers like uh, Tan Doon uh, and Bright Sheng, some of whom have moved uh, to the United States, who have done some uh, work mixing or kind of fusing musical traditions. That I think, if their works, may, uh, I don't know, they may or may not persist, but I think at least that compositional approach has a future. Uh, it's kind of 
multiculturalism or whatever. I mean, that's a broad word, but there are a lot of, a lot of ways we can frame that. Uh, I think that has a future as well that is, that's kind of a draw to interest people if, if it's something new. So, um, you know, I don't want to put money on any of these answers, but that, that's kind of my sense of it. But, they, but again, too, I, I, should, I, should, I kind of want to roll back a little bit. The landscape is so diverse right now and very vibrant in places that institutions like the New York Philharmonic don't even approach. Um, and if we only think about major institutions, we're missing just a huge landscape of new music as well. And so there are these you know, secret corners that, that have kind of niche and small local followings where maybe a lot of great music is happening, but we don't hear about it in the New York Times or Washington Post or something. So, we'll see. You know, what you just said reminded me of a, I think I heard a radio story on NPR three to six months ago about some poetry contest, maybe for women, or, and somebody submitted, it was an Asian name, and I, somehow they pretended they either were male or they pretended to be, no, they pretended to be female, but they were really male. Anyway, it was this whole thing of Beethoven oh, yeah. and Gaucha, you know, just like the identity theft thing to see if you could get picked because you had the right name, like an Asian woman. Maybe the judges thought, this is who we're going to pick because this is so diverse. Yeah, right, yeah. And it was this great, like, social experiment that this person launched. And the other thing that I just realized what you said, you know, I gather, not being a regular symphony musician and I just playing a community orchestra, but our blind auditions de rigueur for, you know, professional orchestras. And, and so it's fascinating that, you know, the performers are chosen anonymously, but the music is not. Right, yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Well, there, there are some, some studies that are slightly flawed and I've in all the details that show that um, once screens were introduced into orchestra auditions, there was a pretty steep rise in diversity, however we want to define that, in terms of gender and ethnicity and that sort of thing in orchestras. And so it's like, it, it, it really did work up to a point. Um, so there's that. But then, as far as compositions go, like, yeah, we know who the composers are. But then, historically, in the 19th century especially, if pieces were submitted to contests and were judged anonymously, critics, they're very crafty, they would say, well, this piece was only a contest winner. It wasn't true inspiration. And so they would use the fact that it was written for a contest to, di to diminish the piece. And so it's like you can never win if you're a composer. <laughs> and so, you know, it, 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 as far as increasing representation on uh, programs, that sort of thing, like, yeah, I think anonymous submissions would have that statistical effect up to a point. Um, but then it's sort of like we would flip the coin to the other side and say, well, what, what's really driving these decisions? Just, you know, so. Yeah. 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 So. I guess the only way it would work is if you had like you found Beethoven's other thirty-two piano sonatas that he never that were never <laughs> published, and it's like, oh, this thing stinks, <laughs> or something, or you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fascinating. So, so is your book for sale here? Oh no, not here. <laughs> no. No, it's, uh, but it, you could get it on Amazon.com okay. or if you get you know live library. Yeah. yeah. Well, Thank you so much for coming. Braving the weather. <laughs>